Okay, so with, with that out of the way, uh, let's talk user onboarding. Um, let's start with a layup. Basically, uh, if you were just to ask what is user onboarding, a lot of people will tell you that it's something like this. Uh, and we can zoom in and basically kind of like a, an interface layered on top of another interface meant to, to describe the interface that it's covering up, basically. Um, and I think that this is a really problematic definition for onboarding for two main reasons. Uh, the first reason is that it's reducing the experience of onboarding and that part of the, the user adoption cycle down to a single design pattern. Uh, which is really limiting for one thing. And then the other main problem that I have with it is if you were to pick a design pattern for user onboarding to be, it would not be this one as far as what I would recommend. Um, the reason being that primarily people really don't like it. Um, the, this actually came up on my radar. This is, I had to look it up, it's a, it's a garage door opening app. Um, and I found this because somebody tweeted uh, this, this screenshot with the caption, uh, I think this app is trying to teach me a football formation. Uh, so I think we've all kind of had that feeling. There you are, you're trying to try, you're kind of opening up this brand new product, you don't know what awaits you, and they're throwing up almost a literal wall full of instructions on things that you have to memorize and kind of giving you a pop quiz before you've even had a chance to try anything out. Um, and you know, to Matt's point, uh, it does seem like a pretty verbose amount of information to provide for something that's the functional equivalent of that, basically. Um, so can be problematic in that regard. The, uh, another example that really got people pretty riled up was when Slate redesigned their site, and everybody who came to it that day got this big uh, wall that was thrown up again and preventing people from going in. And you can see like they're, they're so going out of their way to tell you about the interface that you can't even really see the interface. And there are even things like, you know, our, I love using laser pointers. I'm so glad I, my aim can make it all the way. Um, our most recent stories live here, for example. Like, you know, probably could be achieved by a header above them that says most recent stories or something along those lines. So uh, would really kind of question what the utility of a couple of these points that they're making are, especially if you're looking at that as being an excuse for interrupting the experience that people are looking to have. Um, how does this happen? Uh, I have a theory that a lot of the design process, the product design process, um, if you think of like a user starting a new product and getting up to speed in it, like going from zero to 60, I think a lot of product design is for 60. That if you have a dashboard with charts in it, there's all kinds of beautiful information and they're filled with data going back six months with really interesting peaks and valleys, and if people can connect to other people in your product, then everybody's already connected to everybody that they need to be, and everyone's uploaded their profile pictures and all these things, that everything's fully set up and running. And unfortunately, when you're only designing for that state, you're going to find that uh, people have a hard time getting to that because you haven't designed an experience that facilitates people transitioning from total cold start empty to filled up and thriving and doing a great job in your product. Uh, and so typically this happens after launch or right before launch where all of a sudden people are like, oh no, oh that's right, everything breaks when it's empty. And then you kind of go into like what I call Apollo 13 mode where uh, they had to like figure out how to, like they used this like jury rig the sock to get the air filter to work and things like that. Um, so like just full on damage control. Uh, I th there sounds like some people are having some laughs of recognition out there um, for that. And so to use an analogy, like if you're designing your product in that 60s state, like you're designing a plane, the primary use of a plane is to fly. So you would make sense to design a lot for the, f the, uh, the flight experience. But at the same time, if people can't take off because you don't need doors to fly, so why would you put a door on your plane? Or you don't need wheels to fly, so why would you put wheels on it? Uh, you wind up with something like this, which is really about as useful as having no plane at all because you can't get it off the ground, you can't do anything with it. Um, and then so going back to like the design pattern of having tool tips or coach marks, like eh, maybe the, like we'll just offload this to the user, like, <laughs> like get in somehow, I guess? That's, or like, you know, there's no wheels, but like once you get it going, make sure not to scrape the bottom, could be really dangerous. So like just looking at this as a general thing of like, you're, you're, you're putting the emphasis, you're basically literally pointing out, this is where we screwed up, and now that's on you. So kind of a double whammy in that regard. Uh, the antidote to this, and what I would like to really talk to you about today, is how to start your designing where your users start their using. So looking at where are people coming from, what is the very first thing that they're looking to accomplish, how can you craft an interface that grows and adapts along with them and encourages them all the way to success. And interestingly, like if you look at the most famous uh, video games of all time, like Super Mario Brothers, for example, um, and this is just one example, but there are a lot of them, like the endings suck. The endings are really, really bad. And you'll find that 
I, my theory is, and I think that there's a lot to back this up, is that like, um, they, they, they never wanted to spend a lot of time working at the end of the game because only a small amount of people were ever going to get there. And it would be a vanishingly small number of people if the beginning didn't work really well. So here in like the Super Mario Brothers case, like, thank you. <laughs> like, you've just gone through eight surreal worlds of like non-human enemies and fighting your way to save the princess. Like, thanks. Okay, you're, you're, we're done. <laughs> like, you know. Um, and then also like, push button B to select the world. Like, oh, that's, that's the payoff. That's what made it all worthwhile. I get to push button B. That's terrific. Um, but instead, like, if you contrast this with the very first level of the very first screen of Mario and how lush and, and interesting it is, and there are so many hidden design details that go into this that I unfortunately can't cover now, but there's a, a YouTube video. You, just, you do a YouTube search for Super Mario Brothers level 1-1. This is the thumbnail. Five minutes and 43 seconds, I unhesitatingly recommend. There's so much interesting stuff in there, breaking down just what the first use looks like, how people can learn things without realizing they're learning them. It's really, really awesome. Um, a lot that you can apply to your own design practices as well, whether it's video games, web sites, whatever that might be. Um, but in any case, like starting off with something that where it's really, really engaging, they've got you hooked in, the first five minutes are working really well, that's going to really greatly increase your survival rate of people actually making it to the end of the game, which is once again that f the charts are all filled up and they're interacting with other people and everything that you want people to be doing inside your product. Uh, and another interesting point that they make in that video is that uh, unlike a lot of other games of, uh, that came along at that time, um, basically all of them included an instruction book. But in this case, like, I never read this. And as many hours as I've logged as a kid playing Super Mario Brothers, I never even opened this. And I think a lot of people uh, have that same experience where it's like, I mean, this game sold over 40 million copies. And so like, this is probably one of the most widely distributed books that has never been opened um, outside of any phone book published in the, since the year 2000. But um, so looking at like, nobody comes to read. And when like I would, uh, as a kid, I would go to the video store to rent a video game and you'd get it for three days and I had like one hour of TV time every day. And so I was really on the clock and like the pressure was on. And if there was anything in the video game that required me to read uh, instead of playing to figure out how it worked, I got really kind of like upset as a seven year older. Like this is not, I, not what I came to do. <laughs> like this is, I, I can read anytime, but like this is my TV time. And so, um, and in the same way, like there's you know less parental pressure, hopefully for most of your users, but there is an element too where somebody is struggling with something, and that's really why you sign up with a product because you want to try something new, try a new way of doing things, hopefully be able to be more successful in whatever that thing is, and like you know instead of giving them this really engaging initial experience, you give them like this, like it's homework, you know basically, and so with all due respect to the garage door opening, iPhone app design team, I do think that we can do a lot better than this. So let's dive into some of the core design patterns. First of all, if you're absolutely dead set on using tooltips, there are certain ways that you can do it that are better than, than this particular way. Um, and I'll kind of contrast it to, but I think I saw some Optimizely people in the house. Is that true? Anybody? Yeah? Optimizely represent? I think they do a great job. Um, they have, I mean, imagine if I was like, they're terrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think they do a really, really good job that um, basically uh, this was probably from about nine months ago, so I'm not sure if it's changed a lot, but at that time they had one tooltip at a time. So instead of throwing a bunch of things at you and it's like a memory test basically, it's one single thing that says, hey, you can, why don't you check this out and, and you know, do this particular thing. And also instead of having things like place name or device status or things that should hopefully be obvious but certainly won't be things that people remember five minutes into using the app, um, Optimizely's tooltips are all action oriented. So they say, try it out by clicking add variation. And you click add variation instead of just being like, okay, I understand next, 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 next. Because that's typically what people will do unless if you slow them down and have them actually take meaty actions early in the process. And interestingly too, like Optimizely, gets you through a series of steps, and it's not just introducing you to this part of our interface does this, and this button says this, and it does the thing that it says, and this button does this, but instead they have you do a bunch of things that are leading up to having your first A-B test ready to go. Um, so in that kind of way, you, they're resulting in an experience that once you go through those steps, you have actually built something of consequence that you don't want to lose. And this is a perfect time for them to then say, well, now that you've made this thing, maybe if you don't want to lose it, you're going to need to create an account. And in order to do that, you're going to need to pick a plan. And in order to do that, you're going to need to add your credit card. But it's a really, really reasonable request because people don't want to have to get rid of the thing that they had just made. 
but making the thing was also very, very easy. And so that's a psychological principle called loss aversion, um, which is uh, a test that has been done over and over and over again. Um, but basically, it's been borne out that people dislike losing something that they have more than they like getting something that they don't have, that people would rather uh, keep what they have than, than swap it out for something that they don't, things along those lines. So if you can give people something to lose early in that onboarding experience, and preferably just early in your product experience at all, that's something where suddenly they're going to feel much more in line with your overall experience and the value that your product offers to begin with. Changing gears a little bit. Um, I really wish that we as product people were a little bit more loss averse about the users that are signing up for our product uh, as well. So on the other side of the coin, there's, uh, you know, this being a 500 startups event, it's required that you use a Dave McClure slide, I think. Um, so this is Dave McClure's pirate metrics. Uh, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue, the main parts of the customer acquisition life, si life cycle. Um, if you take the first letters, they this A A R R R, like what a pirate says, hence the name. Um, but basically, like acquisition is really about getting people into the top of the funnel. How can we get people to just kind of throw that switch and sign up and, and try us out? And then the next two are basically about not losing the people that we just signed up. So getting them to activate and, and keeping them retained. And those are the two areas, really two sides of the same coin that onboarding can really help with. So if we look at activation as not losing new users, retention as not losing the people who just activated, um, that's kind of the, the paradigm that I want to work with. And now we introduce a new terminology word, which is churn. Um, and maybe you're like, I don't know, churn's in red. That probably, maybe it's good? I don't, like, is it like this? Like, may, like maybe it's cool? And it's like, no, churn is not cool. Churn sucks. Uh, churn is basically whenever that you're, you're losing people. Uh, the rate at which you lose your signups or the rate at which you lose your active user base. Um, and so let's start with the second one, uh, the retention one. Uh, if we dive into that, you can kind of look at that as being kicked off with conversion, that you are, uh, if you charge for your product, that's when somebody exits a free trial and starts paying or just becomes a paying customer in general. If you don't charge for your product, it gets a little bit fuzzier, but uh, there are certain uh, engagement proxies, like Facebook has seven friends in three days, or uh, Twitter has follow 30 people, but basically, once somebody's reached a threshold where it seems very, very unlikely that they're going to you know, not keep coming back, at least in the short term. And so looking at what you know, churn rates are, what's generally considered acceptable there, 5% churn month over month is typically considered to be like kind of on the lower end of what you should be comfortable with. Or if you go far beneath that, then that's something where you probably want to pull the brake line and say, this is a big problem. Our bucket is really, really leaky. We're spending a lot of effort getting people in to something, and then we're just losing them uh, at a pretty rapid rate. Let's try to shore that up. Um, going back to activation, which comes before retention, the numbers are pretty different. So it starts by sign up, and it ends at conversion, which is when people go into that retention phase. And the numbers that you look at there are typically, it can really vary, but it can, it's typically around 15%. It really depends on if you require a credit card up front or not. Uh, and a couple, obviously, is just going to be different for different products. Um, but if Anybody walked up to me and I just had to guess without any information, 15% is the number that I would guess as far as the people that are making it through the activation phase and becoming active users. And the numbers get even kind of sadder um, because like, you work so hard to build a product that people want to sign up for and you put marketing effort into getting people to sign up for those kind of things and just getting somebody to come back one more time ever again after their very first sign up uh, experience is typically around 50%, give or take 10% probably for most of the products in this room. And so you're going through all of this effort and like looking at the retention phase of like, well, 95%, maybe that's not so great. Here we were experiencing a way huger drop off and, and the, it gets sadder one more time and this is the last time it gets sadder, I promise. But it's also, it's not even 95% versus 15%, it's 95% of 15%. So you're really looking at here, uh, this is something where you're barely able to retain a lot of the people that are coming to your site. Really should help, uh, hopefully indicate to you the really huge importance of nailing that, what's called a first run experience, which is basically people, what happens after somebody signs up in, that, in their first sitting using your product. And then also really focusing on ways to draw people back into your product to get them to be a habitual user and fully up and running uh, with the solution that you provide, so to speak. And so going back to tooltips, um, the one other recommendation that I would make if you do really want to go with tooltips is to expect them to be skipped. 
So do not completely depend upon them, uh, especially if it's not action-oriented, like uh, optimized leads is. Uh, or, but uh, you know, if it is something where it's like, this button does this, next, and then people just go, next, 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 next. Now what the heck do I do? I have no idea. Maybe I've made a terrible mistake, or whatever that might be. But people tend to uh, want to just rush through it because they're not there to learn about all the intricacies of your interface. They're there to accomplish something, and they want to get on that, the send of that trail as quickly as possible. Um, the, the sort of similar uh, design pattern for mobile is the, uh, the intro slides that are like, we are so excited to tell you all about us. Um, and you know, basically, like you can kind of see faintly at the bottom, there's the, the, like the dots, which are basically like, this is how many times you have to swipe left to, to actually start doing something, um, which weirdly is also like the same gesture for saying no to somebody on Tinder. So it's like, just like, okay, I dump you four times, and then now, now I can start doing something, hopefully. Um, so to bear this out, like, you know, after you go through the tour, you, like, you really want to manage the experience that people have um, with your sort of null state or blank state in your product, where basically all the containers are empty uh, and people need to start doing something instead of just learning things. Um, and I like the live chat software, but I kind of pick on them for this one. After you go through their tour, you're presented with this sort of uh, uh, stern response, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Um, it's kind of like walking into your own personal ghost town. Uh, there's literally holes in the interface, uh, and, then, and then four words in, in like, uh, like a particularly sterile gray that says, you have no chats, where it's like, oh, li live chat, seriously, like, I don't know, I, I, what did I do? I don't know, I just, I just showed up here, like, uh, you know, I, I, I really doubt that anyone who walked into live chat HQ and said, I would like to try your product, I, I really don't think the first thing they'd say is, well, you don't have any chats. So, um, Really, any opportunity that you have, seriously, any opportunity that you have to make your product behave as you would in that scenario, I really, really, really highly recommend. Um, speaking of copy choices, uh, YouTube had a certain gem back in 2007 that I was able to dig up from the vault, which is, you have no friends. Uh, <laughs> so really, just kicking that relationship off on the right foot. I can't wait to see where this goes. Um, so, so by contrast, uh, Basecamp is, something, is a company that I think does blank states really, really well. The very first thing they have is like this orange, I should do equal opportunity slides. Uh, they have this orange like paint thing where it's like, oh, okay, this doesn't look like it's gonna be around forever. Maybe I should check this out. What's the first word? Welcome. It ends in an exclamation, exclamation point. Oh, isn't that terrific? Um, so it's a, it's a very humane, very welcoming, very warm and supportive way to greet somebody in your app. And instead of saying, you have no projects, instead they have, hey, we have a project that's made for you, and it's called Explore Basecamp. And believe it or not, this project helps you understand how to use Basecamp. And even when you click into the project, the to-dos tell you how to use a to-do list. And it says, drag me up and down, and click on this button to get rid of me, and things along those lines. It's a very personable way to approach it, and it's also a very well-thought-out way to approach it, that they're looking at a lot of design details that really matter to people, and getting them uh, early traction within the product, and feeling like they're being more and more engaged. Another example that people love is Slack, uh, for numerous reasons, but especially their onboarding experience. People really love, and, uh, like, they could have handled this very easily uh, with like a form, because um, it's like, here they made like a Slack bot, which is a chat bot, which reasonably enough, because they're a, you know, primarily a chat product, um, and so they, they say, to make things easier for your teammates, I can set up a few personal details for you. Uh, to start, what is your first name? could have easily been a field that says first name in some sort of onboarding wizard. This feels so much more uh, lovely in a lot, and, and, and welcoming in so many ways. People absolutely love this, and the bar is really, really low to be able to stand out in this kind of regard. Um, and the other thing, this is like one of my favorites, the copy is uh, at the top, this is the very beginning of your message history with Slackbot. Slackbot is pretty dumb, but tries to be helpful, which I, I, th I want to put that on my business card. Um, so moving on, people are all the way set up with your product. They're ready to go. They're fully activated. Now we kind of shift into retention instead. Um, and in the retention phase, that's really a question about what are the ongoing things that people are going to do, possibly or maybe even preferably over multiple trips or, or visits into your product. Um, and the two main design patterns that I kind of group into one are what I call like completion meters or progress trackers. Uh, in Dropbox's case, it's a to-do list where it shows um, you know, the green checked off ones are things that you've already done. Blue is stuff that you have yet to do. Uh, sort of like a, uh, 
uh, choose your own adventure going from there. LinkedIn has the, com the progress bar and says you're 80% complete. Uh, now go do this thing, basically. And both of these really help key people into what the ongoing steps that they should be taking are, as well as breaking those steps down into really consumable pieces instead of just basically saying, like, you know, it's all or nothing right now. Just letting people see the progress that they're making as they go along. Um, so one question that seems to arise with people when they're talking about, okay, like, well, what should these steps be, basically? Um, and if we go back to the really depressing chart, uh, the question that I ask is like, what's the driving force that's getting, like let's say it's 15% of the people that are actually getting, going to activate. What's motivating them to do this at all? And what's motivating them to, to make it through the, the gauntlet and, and uh, come out on the other side? That clearly they see something in your product and, and want to see it through. What is that? Let's put a name on that. Um, and so for that I have a, a visual analogy going back to our friend Mario. Uh, Mario starts off in the world a uh, very small, uh, runty, stressed out lifestyle where uh, if he touches anything he's gonna die. He's constantly dodging and ducking and diving around from his enemies. Um, and so like, this is kind of like a person uh, before your product comes into their life. And then they, they encounter a product, such as a fire flower, and become a, a thriving, gigantic fireball throwing version of themselves. And what's really interesting to me is not about the product, but the, transi uh, ugh, the transition that is facilitated by the product. And that's really what your company is offering. Um, and I say this over and over again, that people don't buy products, they buy better versions of themselves. And in the same way, when you're creating your onboarding experience, I really recommend that you don't introduce people to your product. You, you set the parameters around introducing them to that better version of themselves and really identifying what is that improvement that you provide and how can you incrementally progress people towards that instead. Super thirsty. Okay. Okay, so going back to the Mario example, you can kind of pick off like the runty Mario, thriving Mario, um, and break those off into two separate lists. And really just writing down what are the things that they're experiencing on either side of it. So without your product, what are they really frustrated with? What are they screwing up? Or how do they feel bad about themselves? What are the things that are like, why are they losing sleep at night? Things along those lines. And then with your product in their life, how are they really thriving? What are the things that they are doing that they never could have done before? Um, one great example of this is like washing machines. You can easily imagine somebody being like, oh, I'm collecting quarters all the time. I'm hauling my laundry down you know, six blocks to the laundromat. I have to sit there for three hours watching it spin. Now I've got this, this washing machine in my life. I can just do it whenever I want. I could wash it with a towel on its own if I wanted to. Everything's money in my life right now. Um, if your product is like that, and it should be, what's the washing machine before and after for your product in particular? Uh, all right, so that's kind of the driving force, and you can kind of set the poles of that between, okay, so when people are signing up, they're, they're freaking out and frustrated with themselves, and then by the time they've activated, hopefully if you've aligned your experience around their improvement, they're feeling much more thriving and awesome about themselves. And that's where you can derive the steps that you're basically defining what completion is. Um, one interesting thing I don't have time to get to, but you can look it up, the endowed progress effect. It's a super awesome psychological study that was conducted about what motivates people to complete things. Um, really recommend checking that out. Um, and basically the gist of it is that if you can take the same amount of steps and preload them with like fake uh, already completed steps, people are more likely to do the, the same amount of steps. So in Quora's case, they have a completion uh, progress tracker where uh, this is like the first time you can ever get to this screen. There's, are, there are wizards in the way before you can ever, ever get here. You never see this to-do list until you arrive at the screen, and yet you've already accomplished three things out of five. So you're like 60% of the way complete um, of a 60% complete on a five-step list instead of 0% complete on a two-step list, but they're functionally equivalent, basically. Um, the one thing that I don't really like about the Quora uh, to-do list is that you would think, oh, wow, they, they've laid this out for me. As soon as I go do steps four and five, I bet they'll like throw a party for me or like pat me on the back or something, and instead it just disappears. <laughs> like, I got what I wanted, I'm out. <laughs> like, and so, <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so that, I recommend not doing that. I recommend any opportunity you have to provide positive reinforcement and basically say, you did a great job. You defied the odds. You're becoming a better person by the minute, thanks to us. Like, you could, we'll throw in, brought to you by our product. Um, but th creating what I call success states. Any opportunity, even if it's just a little inline message that says, congrats, you, did a, you, know, you, you uh, inv invited your first person. Uh, another example that I love is um, when I first started writing on Medium, I loved getting the, your post is on the move emails. And so like, it doesn't even have to be within your application necessarily. Any opportunity to really encourage people to keep moving forward, congratulate them for what they've done, uh, I think is absolute money. So on that note, I would like to end things on a high note myself, thank you so much for having me, and please uh, shoot questions my way. Okay, BJ, you, you can set up. I don't know, I feel like I should give you a checklist of five things for the question you're about to ask, but have three of them already crossed off. <laughs> uh, uh, what questions do we have for, for Samuel while we're switching up here about about onboarding we think um, I, I guess I, I have a question you, you brought up uh, slack yeah and slack has this really interesting uh, little bouncing ball that sort of moves around the the hot spots yeah the, yeah. the app that's very different from the the uh, Football move diagram that you had you had shown earlier is that a is that a more effective tool do you think or is that just an, another flavor of this of the same thing? Uh, you know, I mean, it would really depend on what kind of uh, behavior metrics they're finding from that. I really hesitate, you know, even when I'm doing teardowns publicly or anything, like to really comment on whether something is better objectively or not, uh, unless if we actually just see how it's performing. Um, I, my assumption is that it is something of a, of a flavor of that. Um, at the same time, there are certain things I look at, like is it interrupting the experience? No, it's something that you, it's kind of like saying, hey, you can come and get, the, get to this when you have the time, but it's not preventing you from doing anything that you want to do. So on that, on that sense, it's nice. Um, at the same time, typically whenever you're highlighting parts of the, the UI in a series, like a, 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 I know in their case they'll have like multiple hotspots up at the same time. Um, and that to me kind of creates like a, like a, like a autopilot phenomenon. Uh, I know that when I'm going through it, I just kind of do like, okay, I'll do what you tell me to do here and then something else will pop up and I'll do what you tell me to do here. And I kind of think of it like uh, people who have like GPS in their car, a lot of times we'll just be like circling a block because they're just like, it's like turn left, turn right, turn left. And, but really like they're right at their destination already or whatever that might be. So any opportunity to like not put people on autopilot and have them feel like they're making meaningful decisions and taking meaningful actions uh, is really what I recommend. But obviously people really love Slack and I'm sure that's working really well for them. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, one over here. Okay. Um, you showed um, the classic example of the um, intro thing on the on like iPhone apps and stuff like that where you have a bunch of slides to, to um, swipe through. Uh -huh. um, and I felt like most of your like good examples were web based. Have you what is like the best example you've seen or patterns that you've seen for good um, user onboarding flows in, in in mobile apps? So yeah, what are some good uh, mobile specific user inter uh, user onboarding patterns? Um, I would say, first of all, mobile, it's like you're working with so many more constraints. So it's, it's easy to kind of pick things out on, on desktop or browser just because it's more established and you have more real estate to play with and things like that. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind for me is uh, uh, Foursquare, where they had this, it was a little bit over long in my opinion, but there was a part where they basically just said, like, what are the tastes that you have? And you can just kind of tap on the different things like pretzels or seafood or whatever that might be. Um, and where they were making it something that you were actually engaging in um, and also feeling like you're kind of curating your own experience and customizing it as you went. So that's one that I would point to. Typically, my, my opinion skews really towards how can you have your product, the, how, can, how can you have people using your product, finding the value in it instead of telling people what kind of value they can expect to find once they've stopped learning. Just getting people to do as much as possible. Have your product explain its own value that way. Um, yeah, I guess that would. Okay, Samuel, cool. thank you so much.